get it at the market. Limit your time at the market by planning ahead and making a list. Once there, be sure to adhere to 6 feet social distancing at all times. Purchasing pre-packaged produce helps you avoid touching produce that other people have touched. Sanitize your hands often, especially after conducting monetary exchanges or touching surfaces. If driving, you should place purchased goods in a designated tray within the vehicle. When you reach home, properly sanitize your reusable bags. It's also advisable to properly wash and dry your produce before consuming or storing them. The Belize Marketing and Development Corporation, Ministry of Health and Market Managers encourage all Belizeans to keep safe and buy local. The uncertainty surrounding coronavirus disease may be stressful for children. They may react to fear and anxiety which may lead to negative changes in their daily activities and behavior as a natural response to a stressful event. Some changes to watch out for in children include excessive crying or irritation in younger children, excessive worry or sadness, acting out behaviors such as temper tantrums, poor school performance or avoiding school, difficulty with attention and concentration, and avoidance of activities enjoyed in the past. There are things you can do to support your child. Take time to talk with your child about the COVID-19 outbreak. Answer questions and share facts in a way that your child can understand. Explain to your child the meaning and importance of social distancing. Also reassure them that it's for their own benefit and for those around them, especially older family members like their grandparents. Share with them how you deal with your own stress so that they can learn how to cope from you. Limit your family's exposure to news coverage as children may misinterpret what they hear and can become frightened about something they do not understand. Try to keep up with regular routines, create a schedule for learning activities and fun relaxing activities. Take breaks, get plenty of sleep, exercise and eat well. Deal with the COVID-19 calmly and confidently as children in part react based on what they see from the adults around them. This is a message from the Ministry of Health. How to put on and take off a mask? Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Dry your hands with a clean paper towel and throw the paper towel away. Check the mask for any defects such as a tear or missing tie or ear loop. Throw away any that are defective. Make sure the exterior side of the mask is facing out away from your face. Place the mask completely over your nose and mouth. If the mask has ear loops, put those on top of each ear. If the mask has ties, pick up the mask by the ties and tie the upper ties behind your head with a bow. If the mask has a lower tie, then once the mask is fitted to the bridge of your nose, tie the lower ties behind your head with a bow. Make sure the mask is completely secure. Make sure it covers your nose and mouth so that the bottom edge is under your chin. Wash your hands again with soap and water for no less than 20 seconds. Removing the mask. Wash your hands before removing the mask. Do not touch the inside of the mask. It may be contaminated from your breathing, coughing, or sneezing. Untie or remove the air loops and remove the mask by the straps. Throw the mask in the trash. Wash your hands again to complete the removal. Note, cloth mask blocks some but not all airborne coronavirus. Social distancing and frequent hand washing are still your primary protection measures. A health and wellness message from your Ministry of Health. In response to COVID-19, the government of Belize has implemented strict guidelines on persons to practice social distancing to reduce the spread and risk of getting COVID-19. Practicing social distancing is when one maintains a greater than usual distance away from another person. In public health, it is a practice to prevent sick persons from coming in close contact with healthy people. Recent studies are showing that social distance of 3 feet or more decreases the exposure of COVID-19. Before these restrictions, a person with COVID-19 could infect 2.5 persons in 5 days, 406 persons in 30 days. When you put into practice measures to reduce the exposure activities by half of that one infected person, in 5 days you would possibly only infect 1.25. 30 days, 
15 persons. Reduce the exposure of that infected person by 75%. In 5 days, you infect 0.625. In 30 days, 2.5 persons. Remember, the virus does not move on its own. People move it. The more space between you and others, the harder it is for the virus to spread. A health and wellness message from your Ministry of Health. If you have been directly exposed to the new coronavirus or have a history of travel in infected populated areas, it is recommended that you self-quarantine. Identify room to be used to self-quarantine and limit contact with healthy persons. Keep away from older persons and persons who have medical conditions that affects their immune system. Now? Okay, good afternoon. Um, we are here to provide you an update in terms of where we are with COVID-19. Uh, with me this afternoon is Dr. Natalia Largespada Bear. She is the person in charge of the Maternal and Child Health Unit for the Ministry of Health. Uh, particularly to look at um, pregnancy um, and COVID-19 and overall issues related to primary health care as well in terms of maternal health and how people can access services because mm -hmm. I think that can be compromised uh, based on what we are finding um, and, and the data that we are encountering as we move along. So before I allow Dr. Baer to go on, I'll give you some brief rundown of where we are in terms of our numbers. Um, for today, and that infographic would have just been up on social media platform, we have 27 cases that are positive out of 181 tests that were done. Um, the preliminary breakdown is as follows, in Corozal district, we had two cases out of the 27, one in Altamira, one in Paraiso. In Orangewalk, we had 16 total cases distributed amongst Orangewalk Town, Agos Pine Ridge, San Felipe, Yo Creek, San Lazaro, San Jose Palmar, and San Esteban. Um, in Cayo district, we had five cases total, three in Belmopan and two in Armenia. And in the Belize district, we had four, three in Belize City, and one in San Pedro. We now have, as you will note in that infographic, 10 deaths um, associated or that can be attributed or linked to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I'll give a brief rundown in terms of that so that we can keep track. And as we move along, we will be giving you also further details as to what we are starting to notice with our particular um, patients that are dying as a result of SARS-CoV-2 and it's not necessarily patients who are hooked up to a ventilator for an extended period of time. So I'll go briefly through those. Um, if you recall, well, we'll start off from patients three and four and again, I, I, this is as far as we'll go in terms of classifying people by patients by a number in terms of death. I, I, but I just want us to walk it through because we have to understand that behind uh, numbers and, and classifications that we may have, we have people that are just going to, uh, to closure situations. Uh, I mean, these are patients at the end of the day, they're not just numbers that we just uh, go on and make situations about it on social media or any other platform. So I think we need to be respectful of that. But I, I, I need to be able to explain that to you so that we can put it in the context of what it is that we are finding as we move along. So the first, the, the third and fourth patient that had died on the previous weekend to this one that just went by, um, they had had interaction with the system practically uh, very minimal. Um, in the case of one patient died while receiving care at a private institution, the other patient um, arrived. Um, none of these patients, by the way, arrived to the private or public institution with a diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2. Those, in both instances, they had a diagnosis made after they had died. Um, that's the previous weekend. Almost sudden deaths, if you will. Um, we are now considering, based on what we are finding and based on what's, on what's described in the literature elsewhere, that these could have been just prothrombotic events. And, and we mentioned it at the last time I was here. People who have SARS-CoV-2 are more likely to develop clots. 
um, and that contributes to issues such as choke, um, uh, myocardial infarctions, and pulmonary embolism in the lungs, and, and that can lead to a patient's demise. Um, patient, the fifth patient that died um, was towards the end of last week. That patient had a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19, had been on a ventilator, and of course developed sepsis as a result of widespread infection, which is what can happen when people have been prolonged in a prolonged uh, ventilation situation. Um, the sixth patient is a patient, a female patient that has that was brought from San Pedro and had um, other liver conditions. She was swabbed um, just because she was from San Pedro and when people are deteriorating quickly, you need to find out if there's any other possible contributing factor. Um, that's when we made also the diagnosis of this patient, it's a female. And, and I'll walk through particularly the last four cases that happened, I would say in the last 36 hours, so to speak. Um, so we had a patient, the seventh patient that died is a patient from San Felipe who arrived in distress at the Northern Regional Hospital, um, sent to Carl Huchner almost immediately, and the patient died upon arrival at Carl Huchner. The diagnosis in this patient was done post-mortem, that was done yesterday. Um, we had flagged it yesterday as a potential seventh case uh, dying as a result of SARS-CoV-2. Um, I did um, speak with one of the family members who didn't seem to think that his dad was a case of SARS-CoV-2. This is before we had the diagnosis. They did not refer any contact with any particular um, person uh, that would have been positive for SARS-CoV-2. Again, this is what they are feeding to us. Um, the patient has a following comorbidities that I think we need to be able to describe. He was a diabetic type 2. He also suffers from hypertension, high blood pressure, and had had um, a previous myocardial infarction. So when he started having some level of respiratory distress on Friday, Saturday, from the, what the family member shared with me is that they were thinking he was having some level of decompensation from his previous, previous cardiac condition. Um, because they nebulized him and when he wasn't improving is when they took him to the um, Northern Regional Hospital on Saturday and um, he would uh, die at, at Carl Huchner on the upon arrival. Uh, the eight patient that died also arrived at Northern Regional Hospital. It's a 65-year-old um, male. Um, by the way, this patient that died from Carl Huchner, if I had not said, he, the diagnosis was made until yesterday. Uh, post-mortem. Um, pa the eighth patient that died also arrived at Northern Health Region in respiratory distress, a 65-year-old male, um, had not had previous interactions with the health system. Family members then referred that he had been having five days with flu and fever-like symptoms, but for, I mean they had not accessed health services. Uh, as a matter of fact, the other three family members that were in the immediate close contact of this patient were only swabbed until after their dad had died. This patient also died almost upon arrival. He was swabbed um, because of the high suspicion and diagnosis was also made post-mortem. And the other two patients that have died um, happened earlier today. One patient from Corozal, Caledonia, to be specific, in his late 50s. He had been referred to Carl uh, in the middle of last week also a patient with respiratory distress. When he was initially sent to Carl Huchner, there was no um, diagnosis, immediate diagnosis that is. That diagnosis was made after he arrived at Carl Huchner and he died um, in the early hours of this morning. And the 10th patient that has died as a result is a pregnant um, female who had delivered by C-section and had been discharged from the hospital last weekend and came back within 24 hours um, to Carl Huchner with respiratory distress. We are assuming she had a pulmonary embolism um, and the massive, if, if you will, and that would have brought her back to the hospital. It, it would seem, therefore, that in the last six cases we have had, it would seem that five of those cases at least would have had stages where they would have had pro-thrombotic events, means that they have clots that would have triggered a, a myocardial infarction, emboli in, in, in the lungs, clots in, in the lungs. Um, we have a patient still at Carlucia who had a stroke, an 85-year-old um, 
male who is also positive for SARS-CoV-2, not intubated, not ventilated. He might actually be discharged anytime now if he hasn't. Um, so th those things are what we are looking for our context. And as we move along with SARS-CoV-2, there are many things that we are learning um, as we go along. So for our indications, I think what we had said earlier in terms of chronic diseases is starting to become a reality in terms of our context with risk factors seeming to be right now when you look at and review your data obesity being a primary risk factor uh, hypertension and having some level of cardiac disease would also seem to be factors that contribute uh, significantly to those who have uh, sars cov um, 2 um, uh, so it's important to stress that it's not only the respiratory symptoms that people seems to be looking out for um, or even this false, very false misinformation and conception that people hooked up to a ventilator are the, are the ones that are that. I mean, if you look at the clear evidence that we are having now, that isn't necessarily going to be um, the case. We already know that SARS-CoV-2 has um, a specific affinity for almost all body organs. So, um, I mean, even if you go back in people who do high activity sports, uh, people who run marathons, people who do lots of sports, they are still having cardiac complications weeks or months after having been diagnosed. Classic example, if you follow um, baseball in the US, the, the pitcher that had a diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 has been laid off for the entire calendar year of 2020. And that's simply because when they did a cardiac ultrasound, they found that they had um, liquid around the heart and an inf uh, myositis, which is an inflamed um, heart muscle that's going to take months to recover. So um, that's perfectly described in, in other um, jurisdictions so that it's affecting multiple organs. Uh, I mean, brain, almost any organ that you can think of. SARS-CoV-2 is, is, has the affinity and potential situation that it can can deteriorate any bodily function in that in that light um, one two other notes I want to touch on before I ask Dr. Bear to look at specifically pregnancy because pregnancy is in itself a pro thrombotic state and all the other factors in pregnant women which Dr. Bear will go through that put can potentially put somebody at a higher risk for um, in terms of the repatriation process, um, we have been asked uh, what what um, happened. I think it's close to 90 persons that arrived on the flight on Friday. Um, we did not do any testing as we had anticipated was going to happen. Um, when we went back to review and the data, though, because, you know, people are required to submit information, fill out the repatriation form before they get here. We are finding out that there is many discrepancies between what people are actually reporting um, online versus what we find when people arrive at the airport. I'm saying this because just this morning, three different persons called um, very upset uh, people who came on the flight on Friday um, because they are saying that they are not aware that what they are going through is the process that has been described to them. So people are saying that they were under the impression that they're going to be tested and they could go home. And this despite the fact that they have paid already a 14 day if, period for, for the hotel stay. So um, people saying that they don't have medical evidence that they should not even be in a hotel. But that's why the form is very clear. You fill out the form and if you get that in a clear, concise manner to us before you actually board the plane, it makes it easier for everybody. But we have had people who also appear, show up that are not on the list, I mean, people who do eventually, I guess, climb up on the plane and, and arrive here and don't appear on any, on any list. And you also have people that appear on the list and don't arrive. Because my initial note is we were anticipating 98 people to have arrived on Friday and that did not happen. It's less than 10 or 15 persons less than that. I can't I don't have the final figure in that. Um, so I think it's important that people who have a medical condition provide the evidence. It's not only what... Um, you say on the form you need to provide the medical evidence um, so that we can ensure that you go into a home quarantine. So I'll ask Dr. Baer to walk us through the pregnancy situation and then I'll come back to, with notes in terms of transmission rate, what the current evidence suggests in terms of infectious particles 
and why Dr. Bear and myself has to be wearing a mask when when we are so close. I mean, other times when I'm alone here, it's usually no mask. So I'll explain in, in what the science is saying behind viral particles and your risk as we move along with SARS-CoV-2. So, Natalia. Okay. Um, thanks, Doc. Good afternoon. Um, with In regards to pregnancy and COVID-19, um, remember that this is a disease that was diagnosed in or discovered in 2019. So at the beginning, we did not have um, enough evidence on what could occur in the different groups of population, including pregnant women. At the beginning, we used to um, say that uh, the data was showing that the risk was not higher because of a woman being pregnant. Now, with the latest reports that are coming out, although um, we cannot uh, foresee that there is a strong um, or robust data showing us the, the risk for pregnant women, we have to use what is there available. And from the database from the UK and from the US, and we're talking about um, 15,000 cases of pregnant women with COVID-19 in the US. Um, the data is showing that women uh, beyond 35 years of age have greater risk if they become pregnant. Um, the risk increase if they have chronic diseases, like chronic lung disease, diabetes, heart disease, that increase the, the risk of COVID-19 during pregnancy, and more likely they would require a hospitalization. Um, just recapping on what Doc was saying, we have to remember that um, the, if we look at the cell in the body as a room, then the doorman for that Anything, any person or, in this case, any virus to enter that room that represents the cell is the ACE2 receptors. And ACE2 receptors are present in the nose, in the lung, in the eye, in the heart, the ileum, which is the small intestines, the liver, the pancreas, the brain, kidney, and bladder prostate, and even in the placenta. So knowing that um, these cells that facilitate the entry of the virus into the body are present in these organs, then we move from what we thought was just a, a lung problem, a respiratory disease, to a systemic disease. Hence, the need to look at all of these different factors when managing patients. To date, we have um, nine um, pregnant women diagnosed with COVID-19. One of them was a repatriated case. Um, she's recovered. And then we have eight cases that were diagnosed as a close contact of a positive case. So this is the result of the hard work done by the teams at local level with um, tracking and contact tracing of all positive cases. So we have two cases in Corozal, two cases in Orange Rock, four in Belize District, of which three have delivered already, four in, um, one in Stan Creek. Uh, Cayo and Toledo have zero cases among pregnant women. The recommendations for pregnant women is basically the same that we provide for other persons, a transmission precaution measures, wear the face mask properly, covering nose and chin, um, maintain at all times the six feet physical distancing, hand washing and hand sanitizing, cleaning down surfaces that are touched frequently, and we want to stress on two more for pregnant women. Stay at home. And we know if pregnant women are working currently, well, yes, they have to go to their workplace. 
but um, stay at home mean if you're at home and you need something from the store don't go to the store stores are usually crowded with people and some people wear masks and maybe some may wear it but not the adequate way so get a family member to run the errands so pregnant women um, we have to avoid to the maximum to get um, infected with COVID-19. So stay at home is very important. The next recommendation for uh, pregnant women, please stay away from sick persons. At this point in the pandemic here in Belize, every person, every ill person is a COVID-19 until proven otherwise. So please stay away from sick persons. And um, if um, you have any signs and symptoms like a common a cough and cold, then let's go back to the home remedies that we used to use um, before. Because it is, there is documentation that, and I will mention them, fever grass, ginger, lime, onion, garlic, all of these have anti-inflammatory properties they have a they help you with the cough and the cold so um it's good to to have these if you feel like you have a, a cough and cold if there is any a worsening of your signs and symptoms then you need to contact your um, district or the hotline at headquarters and then um, share what you're experiencing, and then the team will facilitate your um, proper follow-up or testing if needed. We have a case where, um, well, we have a group of nurses in each one of the district, the public health nurses and the rural health nurses. And since March, we have made changes to the way we provide services. So pregnant women that are high risk, those are seen as planned but low risk pregnancies we are recommending to follow them up by phone and if needed then we bring them in as needed but we want to reduce as much as possible increasing the risk of pregnant women coming to the hospitals for care when it could could have been a provided the care through the phone so limiting the, the visits to the hospital as much as necessary. Yes, we want at least one prenatal care first trimester, one prenatal care face-to-face -face second trimester, and one at the third trimester. Um, as I was mentioning this morning, we need to eat healthy as much as possible and um, help our immune system. The data is out there, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, and, and that will help us to, um, to prevent COVID-19. And um, I guess that will explain the use of the mask and the importance for um, the prevention of the, especially the severity of the cases, if we cannot avoid not catching it. Yeah, well, uh, there's questions here specifically for Dr. Bias. I guess we'll go into the questions and then we'll go into okay. the specifics of sneezing and coughing and talking. Um, it says here, if pregnant, sh if a person is pregnant, should the person take any special precautions or preventive measures at home or at work? The general precautions, um, as I was mentioning, the wearing mask, wash your hands, clean down surfaces, uh, the distancing, physical distancing, stay at home, and um, stay away from sick persons, persons that are ill. Okay, that's question one. And this is the other question. If mothers are COVID-19 positive, can the babies also test positive when they are born? Um, there is no hard evidence of transmission from mother to child, but there are some reports, small studies, but um, we still consider them um, and use the data. It goes from having no infection up to even 20%, but 
we, we know that that is not the definitive um, data on perinatal transmission. Okay, so um, I'll go back to my notes in terms of the importance of wearing a mask and the prevention measures. So what the current evidence is suggesting, and um, I try to explain it so that we all can understand what, what we're trying to measure things with, is data suggests that in order for anybody to become infected with SARS-CoV-2, you would require about 1,000 viral particles to be inhaled into your system. And that's just so you can give you, and I'll give you what routinely happens or what adds up to 1,000 viral particles. In a normal respiration process, which means if I'm just sitting down here going to my routine breathing, I can be shedding up to about 20 viral particles every minute. Yeah, if with my mouth closed, if I am just... So if you do the math, right, it takes you 50 minutes more or less to shed 1,000 viral particles. If you are just breathing here, two persons sitting down, right? And that, that's when people talk about close contact, high contact, that's what you need to start to factor in. Of course, this is just average situation. So that's the relevance of both people wearing a mask if you cannot keep the six foot distance. Mm -hmm. At minimum, it should be three. Ideally, it should be six. Even WHO recommendations talk about three feet distance between two persons is good enough. Primarily for that reason. It doesn't necessarily have to do with touching people. It's just the fact that even breathing alone gives you this amount of viral particles. When you're talking, you're shedding about 200 viral particles per minute, which is why if Natalia and I are talking with no mask on, then within five minutes, no mask, face-to-face -face contact, you would have shed a thousand viral particles, mm -hmm. which is the threshold for infecting somebody. So when you go to the strict math, they tell you a contact of four minutes or less is what puts you within a safe zone if you never had any mask. So that's important when people are calling in to say, oh, I had a contact. I, I'm, the security guard is positive. I had a brief interaction with the security guard with both of our masks mm -hmm. on. I need to be swabbed. That's what people are calling not necessarily you're not a close contact just because of that casual interaction so that's basic science remember we keep saying if you have any respiratory symptom you should not go to work you should not really be in the public transportation you should not be so that even when you're in a bus because people are talking about crowded bus it's not the fact that you're touching as i have said this is the time to perhaps stop talking to your passenger on the side of mm -hmm. sitting with you. This is time to bring your headphones, get a book, everybody wears a mask, and or go to sleep, whatever, but make sure your mask is on, right? Because the minimum interaction you have in terms of talking, the less likely it is that you're exposing others within that bus setting, which, I mean, the congestion is what people talk about. Yeah. And the importance of, of respiration and, and the dynamics of it is when you cough, you may expel up to 200 million viral particles right. with one cough. And that's why there's a value of people having signs and symptoms to be staying put, to be not be moving, not only for SARS-CoV-2, for any other respiratory situation. Um, in one cough, you can actually expel up to 3,000 droplets, right, which are invisible. And you might have seen some of the videos that say, when you know you people put in, in, in a specific studio and they against light, how many droplets? And those droplets can be expelled with one cough up to 50 miles an hour, right? So that's why relevant of proper respiratory etiquette, if you're ill, you need to stay home. Um, mm -hmm. Sneezing can be up to 200 million viral particles as well, every time you sneeze. But that sneezing actually releases 10 times as much droplets as a cough, up to 30,000 droplets traveling at 200 miles an hour. So even if you're in a setting, like in this room I sneeze, then those droplets are expelled at 200 miles an hour, right? And if you don't have your mask and you mm -hmm. have the proper uh, gear to protect your eyes, your nose and your mouth, then that's the risk that you are 
that we are placing ourselves at. Understand also that the current evidence suggests that up to 40% of infections are transmitted by asymptomatic persons. And that's important because that's the relevance of why we both need to be wearing a mask. Because I don't know if in this process of interaction any of one of us is positive and not yeah. keeping that six foot distance. That is the value of wearing a mask until proven um, otherwise. So the high risk contact areas are going to be any closed space that has a good amount of, of persons or increasing number of persons and a changing number of persons. Concerts, movie theaters, casinos, um, bars that have ACs, uh, workplaces that have that are ex um, excessively congested, um, closed bathrooms um, that have a high amount of flow of people going in and out, or closed restaurant settings versus low risk environments such as um, walking, jogging by yourself, cycling by yourself, uh, you know, being alone in as much as you can being out in the open spaces and ensuring you're doing physical distance, those are the easier mechanisms then to avoid getting infected with SARS-CoV-2. Beyond just touch, right? Because I think initially when we didn't, many things we didn't know, touch was seemed to be one of the higher risk mm -hmm. situations. But now because of how it is transmitted, it, it's simple activities such as talking, um, or breathing alongside somebody that is, and you're not wearing a mask, those put you at a higher risk than um, the hand situation. The hand is, you need to wash it be before it touches your face and simply because you're touching surfaces where respiratory droplets or whenever droplets when we're talking are being left around, and invisible to you, you touch it and then touch your face, that's a potential risk. But simple activities such as breathing and talking would seem to be for the time being high risk factors, especially if it's in closed environments where you have ACs that, that don't have adequate ventilation as well. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the questions that I have and I think we'll share some of those questions with Natalia. It says here, what are the projections of number of cases and number of risky? Would you now categorize the situation in the mainland as community spread? Um, it would seem that Orange Walk seems to have a similar situation as Hamburg Risky. Um, I do know that we are telling numbers for all the different villages so that we can give that um, uh, to Minister for Cabinet tomorrow to make other decisions that may need to be made. I know particularly today they are looking at the community of San Felipe, August Pine Ridge and Blue Creek, I believe, for potential situations that may be there. In terms of projections of number of cases and number of risky, we are still running tests, not as many as we were doing before. Uh, we anticipate that the numbers will continue to come down in some in number of risky. Recall that they are now into their uh, fourth week, I believe, since they started with that lockdown. So numbers are expected to to start to to come down after they had the community spread. Um, where are the test results for San Pedro so low? Have you stopped testing in San Pedro? No, um, we're still doing testing, not as many as we were doing before, um, but we're still getting cases. I think we had some numbers um, I shared earlier um, with where they are. Um, will MOA start testing people with symptoms and no contact with confirmed COVID patients? We are doing that out of the 27 cases that we identified uh, and reported today, for example, in Orange Walk, six of the 16 cases don't have any link to any previous case. So they were tested as a part of the routine surveillance in people who are uh, symptomatic uh, in Belicity as well. Not all of the three are linked to any previous case. So that's part of routine surveillance that's happening. Um, why is it the health officials deny those who have already been in contact with someone who got a positive result? Uh, well, it depends on the level of symptoms. For example, in San Pedro, we did say we were going to go. We can't test eventually the entire community, but if you are a close contact and you have symptoms or you are a high risk person, like the patients we I described earlier, or pregnant or young children, elderly children, diabetics, hypertensive, those are going to be on the list first in terms of swabbing um, and getting a, a res result processed. Um, 
on the standard we still have about 500 samples to process so it's not just as easy as getting some and sending it we're still trying to prioritize um, today how we're going to handle all those samples that keep coming in um, can you speak specifically to use of ivermectin to treat COVID-19? It's a very interesting question. Um, and I noticed that there's a trend happening somewhere that talks about why we are not routinely using it and we eliminate parasites and SARS-CoV-2 um, at, at the same time. It's actually not as straightforward as it may seem. When you read the science behind ivermectin, similar to what's behind hydroxychloroquine, Ivermectin has been shown to work in vitro, which mm -hmm. is an experimental lab situation, but it has not been proven to work in vivo, which is the next phase of any test that you do with any medication. So while it seems to work well in a petri dish in a lab somewhere, once you start using it in the general population, it has not been proven to have any substantive um, backing to, to make its use more routine then similar to what happened with hydroxychloroquine so it's not routinely recommended i know some people are saying and again this is the dangers we were alerted of a situation where in san pedro people were using hydroxychloroquine without a prescription putting people at risk um, that is also if you have a pre-morbid pre condition if you have a cardiac condition and you use hydroxychloroquine that can lead to arrhythmias, irregular heart rhythms, and people can die as a result of that. So if it isn't COVID, then you can have a situation with hydroxychloroquine. Similar to ivermectin, it can have potential secondary side effects. So it's not something that people should routinely use and assume that it will be okay or it's prophylactic for SARS-CoV-2. There's no specific medication that has been proven yeah. um, to work for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Please expound on the Belmopan cases. Are these related to previous cases? Residents of Belmopan proper. Um, this keeps changing, right? Because I, I don't, I mean, people, it doesn't seem that whatever data we give people are fully content. <laughs> we br gave the bro we gave the information broken down. You know, we said Las Flores, Belmopan, people got upset because th that should not be. We should all include in Belmopan. Now we include the Belmopan. People want to know if it's from the but my pan proper, I guess it's, it's, I mean, again, as we have said, as we move along with the data and as more and more data comes, we will not be able to give the full breakdown of every single community. Like somebody yeah. asked me how many cases we have in San Esteban because people are all over the place. Well, I don't know if right now it would make a difference whether you have 10 or 12 cases in San Esteban. If we identify community spread, we will see it, but one by one as they add up, I don't know that we'll be able to track down all the communities um, across the country. Later on today, we will share another infographic that will show you where the active cases are per district. That's as far as you can break it down for, for persons right now. And just before we get hacked again, because I'm sure people will criticize the infographic that it doesn't add up, the numbers are not going to add up in terms of total identified positive cases in a given community versus the current active cases we have and that's a simple reason because if i got swabbed in belmopan but i am go doing my quarantine in stan creek then i will appear as an active case in the stan creek district mm -hmm. so i'm already putting that information out because you'll see the infographic in terms of active cases in the map we'll share later on today it will not add up once you look at confirmed versus active cases active cases is where patients are actually residing as it appears in our system. Um, I guess it's the same question that applies for many cases does Billy City <coughs> itself have. Same issue with um, San Esteban. Um, what are other patients to do that need to see specialists at the regional hospital? I don't know if you, did you explain what pregnant women need to do in terms of accessing healthcare? Yeah, we did um, explain that oh. um, it's by appointment for high risk patients. Uh, there is no change. Uh, whatever amount of um, visits they need, they will get for a low-risk patient. The follow-up will be by phone for both appointments and a continuum of care. Okay. Now, because this is asking about other specialists, uh, that should also continue to be... I gather that most regions have now moved to working by appointment, especially yes. people have chronic yeah, diseases, the hypertensive patient, patients, the diabetic patients. It's best if you work 
through an appointment system because mm-hmm. that minimizes your time waiting, um, your potential exposure, and we also want to make sure that people have adequate access to their medications, uh, you know, for one, minimizing your time that you're moving in and out of your home. So that's the same situation that we need to follow. I don't want people to gather that because there are active cases in a given hospital that you should not come in, um, you know, to, to have your care taken off. Uh, what about working in closed air conditioned offices? Ideally, if you can, I know that at Ministry of Health, some offices have stopped using AC now. They brought their little fan and they just open all the windows. I personally never really use ACs, even though there is one. I, yeah, I mean, that's if you are alone in your office, that, that is pretty much good. But if not, then you will have to wear a mask if you're always yeah. in with other persons. Minimize the talking. If anybody is ill, that person needs to stay home. Um, basic uh, uh, prevention measures because it's not going to go um, SARS-CoV-2 is not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, can you discuss the observed infection rate percentage-wise coming out of the batches of tests and if this is an indication of any trend? I was asked earlier by the NOC this question. I don't want to take it like that. I know that the percentage seems to be in a downward trend. Um, you know, when you're having 78, 80 cases or 50 plus cases, uh, granted we're doing 100 more tests, but when you do percentage, it does seem to be that there's a downward trend, but uh, I think it's too early to be saying that. Mm-hmm. Um, and depending on where you go and find, for example, the team that's out in Orange Walk today looking specifically for those communities that have been having higher, um, you know, infection rates, um, I, I think that might take your curve up a little bit higher. I don't, I think it's too early to be talking about any trend. If you ask the EPI unit, they will tell you we probably will peak or should peak um, within 10 to 14 days and then those numbers should start to drop, provided we all do what is expected from us in mm-hmm. terms of the com- the contact that we have. I mean, we are the ones who are moving the virus. We, the, the community, it's not anybody specific. Um, can you discuss the shortage of PHIs in the central region and the effect of this on the ground? Um, I think that before it went to central health region, we had a shortage in western health region. Um, so what normally happens is there's a little bit of task shifting, which means some other persons are recruited to do some of the activities that they are doing. In terms of SARS-CoV-2, I'm not saying that anybody will replace the other aspects of PHIs. Um, I don't, I've not gotten any indication from the central health region that they are um, necessarily, you know, stopping doing most of their, again, targeted activities. There are some activities you're going to have to prioritize, some activities you'll no longer be able to do. Um, so I, do, I anticipate that if they have any problems, then we can bring people from other entities. Um, I know we were asked about hiring new staff that that is on the ground that's on part of the um, proposal that was submitted to idb for hiring new staff but also even if you bring 10 new phis you're going to have to go through a training process it's not going to be an automatic um, situation so that's being looked at um, right now um the, with the infographic i also think that people are asking more and more data they want to be broken down by sex per district age group people want to know um, um lots of other things the infographic can only carry so much information because then it becomes too loaded and what you're finding is people will always find something that they want from the next infographic so uh, as we move along we try to provide you with the data as it comes along and we are not able to satisfy all the all the requests in terms of data um the carl hishner situation i as far as i know today they have um, two ventilated patients. Um, they do have 16 ventilators that they can use. Um, the reason why the COVID containment area was, I think, a little bit unclear in terms of what went out as a press release on Saturday is because they had five adult and one pediatric ventilator for the COVID containment unit, um, which is the specific COVID unit. So. Two or three weeks ago, when you asked us how many ventilators the Carlucian have, we said right now it's six. You know, we'd had no ventilated patient back then. 
Once you start getting your first ventilated patients, then another six ventilators were taken from here to be placed at Carl Huesner. Carl Huesner had another four and that adds up to the 16. So what it does is once you have your containment area full, of course, you now only have two. They had four on the weekend. Um, so they have two. Um, and then you had, I believe, seven or eight patients awaiting either results or had been confirmed for COVID-19. So that's when you start spreading out beyond what is labeled as a COVID-19 containment area to the other assigned areas that we knew what we were going to do or use once you had gone beyond your six patients. Um, and the reason why it, the A and E situation was highlighted is because the flow of A and E patients would be to a different route. Of course, as you get more and more patients, there are services you're going to prioritize. Why? Because you don't have that much staff. Even if you have 16, 20, 25, 50 ventilators, you might not have the human resources to ventilate 30 patients, even if you have 30 ventilators. And if you do, then you have to sacrifice some services that are no longer that priority or strategic. I mean, you might have to do away with elective surgeries, with mm -hmm. outpatient departments, you know, only a and &E situations. I mean, you move along contingent on your patients that you have. Um, so they do have the 16 ventilators. People ask, are they functional? Right? We just want to know whether they work. Well, they are functional, but it's, again, ventilation is not the panacea for SARS-CoV-2. Ideally, the work and the messages we have been trying to bring across to everybody is precisely yeah. to avoid anybody getting to a ventilator. Right? So the work that the team from Benopan went to try to do in Orange Walk complement the work that's already happening there then is to avoid people getting to a ventilator to avoid people dying as a result or people having to be hospitalized for extended periods because of SARS-CoV-2. Um, they have more questions here for Natalia it says here what are the preventive measures in place at Carl Huesner are there mothers that delivered kept in a different room Yes, um, Carl Hushna have a whole area dedicated for COVID-19 and we have, they have specific rooms for pregnant women, for women postpartum and for the newborn if necessary, if the newborn is tested positive. Um, which has been the case of the two deliveries by C-section at mm -hmm. Carl Hushna. Yeah. I says, how about postnatal care for babies what is the hospital doing to ensure baby and mom will be okay uh, for the positive um, pregnant women who delivered and then are discharged home the public health nurses will continue to follow up on the patients or the rural health nurses uh, until she recover from the disease okay um, I don't know that we have any other it doesn't seem we have any other question um, oh, two other things, um, rapid tests, because we keep getting asked. We had a discussion with NOC. Um, recall that the Ministry of Health was in the process of procuring two rapid tests only for a specific population, and that's for tourists that were not coming into the community, that were coming to a safety corridor. In discussions with the NOC earlier in my presentation, that still remains. It's not that we were anticipating doing rapid tests for the general population. Um, why? Because it still has uh, on specific levels of specificity and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Not that we want to control that, we want to make sure that we do it right. We're finding that one Eastern Asian country is now being sued because they were doing rapid testing in the general population and lots of people started out with false negatives okay. and just continued the spread. So those are the kinds of situations you want to avoid. Do you want to, at the end of the safeguard um, what happens in the general um, public. So I think we need to specify and stress that. Um, so from, I don't think there's any more questions. I don't know, Natal, if you have any other point that you want to stress before we go. I think no, um, just that um, we continue to practice the transmission precaution measures. Um, it will help if the infection was inevitable that is not the same getting it while using a mask or getting infected without a mask without the use of a mask 
there is a huge difference. So we need to be conscious of that. Um, they just explain it quite uh, comprehensively. So I think we are we are now fully understanding the impact of not putting in practice these recommendations. And it depends on each one of us. The only way we can stop this uh, spreading of the disease is if everyone do their part. Everyone wear masks, everyone washing hands, everyone physical distancing. And for pregnant women, avoiding coming in contact with persons that are ill and stay at home as much as possible. Um, the other, I think from my vantage point, the other elements that we are fighting other than SARS-CoV-2 or items related to SARS-CoV-2 is fear. I think there's a lot of fear, fear still of the unknown and six, seven months after we have, you know, tried to have ongoing messages for the general population. Um, we can understand fear, um, but I, I think the only way we conquer this is if we start uh, an educational process on a daily basis, making sure we get the information from the adequate sources and not necessarily social media is not the best or even news media outlets. Some of them are, are not really going to provide you as a best source of information. So make sure you're getting it from an adequate sources. Um, so that, that happens and that fear is what drives some people to perhaps not access health services routinely when you have people saying oh, a ventilator is going to kill you, that, that kind of situation. We had somebody even asking us, can you decline being put on a ventilator? Of course you can decline, but that is your lifesaver at that point in time. That's the reason why it's being offered. Stigmatization, I, I think that's a, mm -hmm. something we fight on a routinely basis. Uh, healthcare workers being stigmatized. Patients who are positive are being stigmatized. You know, some people say, why do they wait until they're dying? Well, it's a stigma. I mean, people don't want to be classified as a potential case. Yeah. Um, the, one of the persons did say, his family members did say where the, the potential risk would have been, and the gentleman just refused to go for five days. Um, family members did being stigmatized as well. Healthcare workers being stigmatized. Um, you know, the, 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 that is something we need to be able to um, to conquer, and the only way we conquer that is by really learning to the proper source of information. And the other thing we, I think, fight on a routine basis is misinformation. Um, th those three things make our process and our job much more difficult, uh, but it's part of the growing situation with, with SARS-CoV-2. Understand that information changes every day. Um, mm -hmm. Just found out this morning that now there is proof, had been shown not necessarily out in, in public, but that people can become reinfected with SARS-CoV-2. There is now evidence that somebody after five months of having, um, yeah. you know, gone through the first phase of a disease has gotten reinfected. So now there is proof. So I think what needs to happen is we need to internalize this. We need to understand that we need to change the way we go about doing our day-to-day -day activities because the virus is not really going to go anywhere and we are the only ones who can move a virus. Mm -hmm. And that's not spreading fear into anybody, but that's part of process that we need to internalize so that we can really um, have a united um, community front, if you will, versus uh, this new disease. Um, so thank you very much for, for listening and for the support to the healthcare workers. Um, and we'll provide more information to our social media platforms. And thanks, Natalia, for awesome. the issue with the pregnant woman. Thank you.